All right, so our next guy is actually an attack and funny the way it just started because um, so uh, our next guy is uh, Dan. Um, it's funny the way because I realized it, it's going to be very funny because the next slide is actually wrong because it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually don't know why. I think I remember why. Um, so I played the graphical business to it and I was so. There's a picture of Ken. But I think. Oh, that's why. It was supposed to be funny. Alright. I forgot that. I just forgot. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And then actually, it's great the way it turns out because I was going to say, like, no, this is good. No, 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 no. That's what it turns out. Yeah, right. So this is that. So I got a picture right here. It's funny because it started, I was. Glenn was away for a couple of minutes and. And uh, I, I, I was starting to, to set up the microphone on, on Ken. And since I wasn't looking at Ken after a few seconds, because I was very gentle, so he, he leaves me, he almost let me put the microphone and then he said, and he goes and said, Yeah, I don't like to talk this thing. But that is all the time. <laughs> As for Glenn, I have a very funny story, which is the road to Winners Conference 2011. I don't know if you remember. But I do remember. Uh, this is the only guy on earth I know who can actually scratch a car and stay cool while driving. So we are driving from the airport to um, the conference center at Venice Conf, and uh, those guys had um, rented two cars, right? Because we were with the whole family. So I go to Glenn's car, and I'm, I'm in there uh, uh, with Glenn's uh, son at the time. Because we didn't have the dollar. And he drives, and then, then comes a bridge. And those streets are, the NS companies are very small. And we just feel like an amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, ah! And he's like, it's fine. <laughs> The other thing, speaking of cool, is that for Glenn, at 2x isn't cool enough. He invented at 20x. Um, and that at 20x is this window. This is one of their apps which I uh, always use, uh, conference guide. Uh, sorry, uh, call the conference guide. You guys are going to be totally mixed with, with the X call conference report for our channel. And um, this is an actual, by the way, this is an actual screenshot from the Retina display, but before that he had an amazing, he made such a letter a couple of years ago, and so um, in, in uh, whatever, illustrator or something like that, so when Ed two weeks came, they were just like laughing like a book. Alright, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome uh, Vlad Kassuslan. Well, this 
is cool, you know, like a bit of Kex on, on gear.com. And um, Hannah always finishes OS 9 up, and then um, they canceled OS 9. And so started started working on OS 10 apps. And um, then when the compiler fizzled, we switched over to OS 10 full time. And since then, we've been selling Mac apps. You know, most of our buddies have moved on to iOS and the more fun stuff. And, um, We've, we've found our niche in Mac. Um, it's so, it's so, um, unlike Drew's um, great Mac presentation, our revenue is 100% Mac. And we, I think we, we make like a couple dollars here and there from refer people to things. Other than that, it's all, it's all Mac apps. Um, our popular apps right now are, are eyeglasses, um, Printopia, Phone View, and Call Recorder. And then we have some less popular stuff. So, what makes people love apps? Before I move on, I should probably mention um, our approach to running our app business is kind of old school these days. Um, we don't sell through the app store. Um, we're still developing from app support, that's pretty old school. And so, so while some of this advice that I'm going to give may not apply specifically to you right now, I'm hoping maybe I'll inspire you to you know, strike out there and see what you can do for the map. And, um, and, and know that, um, that the app store is not the end all, be all. Give you some interesting perspective. I'll be mentioning Printopia a lot. Um, Printopia is um, an app that we did um, almost two years ago, um, which runs a print server on the Mac and lets you print on your iOS devices to all of your printers. Um, and it, just, um, it also lets you print virtually. So. You'll get a printer call something like send a map, and that will just spit out a PDF on your map. We also have workflows that can attach onto that. And, um, and one of the nice things about having app people like is that they tend to tell people about it. When they discover a great solution, it's like it's like they had a really cool meal or something, and they want to tweet about it. And um, we have collected about 800 tweets about Printopia. People just read it about. We look through them, making make this presentation, and ask ourselves, you know, why do people love Printopia? And uh, we base some of the presentation around that. Let's talk about some of the things people tweeted about. The first one, make sure your demo wow. It's a good place to start because the first impressions are everything. In most cases, the demo is going to be someone's first impression. Um, so it's important to make sure your demo or your trial is a really good experience not something frustrating. Now to back up for a second here. Have a demo. Now, this may sound obvious, but you know, with the, with all this uh, app store stuff, uh, people tend to forget about the demo. We don't hear about it so much. People have to do things like previews and, and light versions. But um, on the Mac side, demos are still really important. And, um, don't forget, if your Mac app is in the App Store, you can still have a demo on your website. There's no rule against that. You can, uh, people can go to your website, download your demo, and then uh, maybe you can even you know, send them through your own e-commerce system and, and not have to get out of there percent If writing a demo gives potential customers peace of mind and confidence, that's the way we look at it. When someone's getting ready to give us money, if they know already that their app is going to do exactly what they want it to do, um, they're just going to feel totally comfortable giving us money. And um, it's a good feeling for us. We, we don't feel like we're ever going to rip someone off because they know exactly what they're buying and, um, and they have that confidence. They try it, so that's what they want. You have yourself a customer. So, what should a demo be? Ideally, a time limited version of your program. We do seven days. I don't know why we do seven days. We just always done seven days, right? And um, at this point, the app just stops working. Things get you know gray out, and it tells you to buy the app. You buy a nice little link to the stock cart. Now we see a lot of apps that do it differently. Like we, we, we see an audio app. Some any audio app will, will really limit your recording time to it. 
30 seconds or something in the We've seen one that overlays first to static over the audio. And I mean, that's, maybe it's really effective, I don't know, but it seems like a frustrating experience. We've always wanted our customers to you know, get, know exactly what they're going to get out of the product. Maybe you can use it in their normal workflow for a couple days without having to deal with these weird, frustrating demo limitations. And, yeah, you're not, you're, you're not impressive, you're not wow from that first minute when you, when you impose weird limitations on the demo. And keep it simple. Um, it's important not to confuse your user. Um, when someone doesn't really know what's the demo and what's not the demo, that leads to these people emailing you and going, you know, this isn't working right. Um, is that because it's the demo? No, probably not. But, um, you want to make sure it's very clear. Never, never a surprise. This is my favorite terrible demo example. The countdown is off. What's going to happen if it goes to zero? I don't want to be around to find out. Maybe it's going to explode. But don't, don't do this, of course. And, um, <laughs> Seven day demo is not always going to make sense. If you have an app that's going to be used as a one off thing, then you don't want someone to just use the demo and then not have to pay you. So, so an example is our card grader recovery app that Ken had on the screen yesterday. Um, that will allow you to recover your entire card in the demo, but it withholds the full size versions of, of the photos. It just gives you like a tiny one that's a thumbnail. But again, you can very clear what's going on. So don't confuse people. It should be very straightforward. Another example is our phone view app. It's um, an another example of limited functionality. Um, but so it shows you your first ten text messages from your phone. But we explain it very clearly it's in line with the rest of it. It's not no one's been emailing and say it's why we only show it in ten. It's cleverly sort of explained in there. Some so some demo pro tips, keep it simple and clear. It's going to be app by app and think hard about it. We had a really long discussion, three person discussion, about whether to put a little demo message in the footer of everything you print in Utopia. Um, and in the end, we decided not to. There's no little mad message in the footer we print out. And it's worked for us. Before I move on, I should point out it's okay to be annoying once the demo expires. This is something that's really worked for us. Once you have an expired seven day demo on your computer, just nag the crap out of the person. They can just uninstall and make the demo go away. And we, we had some situations where we didn't realize we were doing this. But um, was it eyeglasses? When eyeglasses expired, we were copying these messages all over the place. And uh, so once we realized that, we weren't sure whether we should remove that because the app itself was really loud. So. <coughs> Pricing. So does pricing belong in a talk about creating app users will love? Of course it does. People love feel like they got a great deal. They love it. They want to show it from the rooftops. And for our Mac apps, people seem to love twenty dollars. We have an app at thirty, most of our apps are twenty. And we think twenty dollars has value without saying you know, a lot of money. People are okay with this. And now this is the conventional wisdom that you hear at that some talks that if, if nobody's complaining about the price of your app, you're not charging enough. And um, it's, it's kind of true, but we prefer to make people happy. And we feel like that makes us more sales because, again, people love sharing this information. They want to tweet about, oh, I just got this great deal. It's part of the reason that, that bundles are so successful. When someone feels like they get this awesome bundle deal, they just they tell all their friends. They don't want to keep that information to themselves. The next point, solve a critical problem. This rule is, of course, more useful for people that don't have an app idea yet. But if you think about it, over the past few years, few years um, most of the kinds of computing that we used to do on our apps is kind of transferred over to our iPhones and iPads. Games, social media, all that. So what are people doing on, on their, what are people buying for their app? Um, productivity apps, um, mostly made by Apple these days, um, and uh, the existing utilities, which is fine, so a pressure to it. But um, of course, everyone would love to have an app that provides unique solutions, right? Easier said than done. But it's a great question to ask yourself when you're 
deciding whether to create an app or not. When someone finds it, are you going to be saving their day? What makes anyone more happy than the day is saved? We see a lot of apps out there that want to be a part of someone's day. But the problem with that is if you're, it requires, you know, changing someone's behavior. Twitter, or something like that. I mean, you're changing the way someone spends their day. That's really difficult to do. When it's successful, it's going to be really, really a big deal. But that's, that's rare. Um, our approach is find the problem that people already have, identify that problem, and then create a tool to solve that problem. Don't try to invent a problem. Take our phone view app, for example. It lets users save their text messages with PDFs. It's not a common thing people want to do, but uh, there's millions of iPhone users out there with Macs, and when they do want to save their text messages, they Google it. And um, there we are at the top, saving the day. Uh, maybe they had a court case, they need to present their text messages to a judge, or, or they, uh, something like that. And uh, it just kind of out there, waiting to wait. It's our niche. And uh, since it's pretty much the only way to do it, we really save on marketing. We do almost zero marketing. So your app doesn't have to solve a common problem, just a critical problem. And um, if you, unless you want to spend 90% of your time marketing, you kind of need these people to buy your app. Also keep in mind, while it helps, your solution doesn't have to be a unique solution. An example is by this Printopia. It's an example of not only can customers just go up and buy a new print for not really much money that supports everything, but uh, we actually have free competition. Now, uh, you'll notice this looks really similar to Printopia. It's kind of a Samsung style rip off of Printopia. We, I actually had to email them to tell them to stop using my actual on off switch graphic that they just copied and pasted out of the bundle. And they were nice enough to do that. Nice guy. <laughs> Can you see what's doing this? No, it wasn't, no, this is the update. The, it was the same in graphic. No, I mean, not exactly the same. It's the output button doesn't have the dot, dot, dot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Totally different. The look. Can you repeat that? And I'm pointing out that it's, it's not a total copy because it's about, not about, dot, dot, dot. We give access to these settings. We realized early on people would need to do this. For example, this one here, um, this is an example of some big, huge printer where you need to input a job ID and all this crazy stuff. There's no way you'd ever be able to do this with, with, uh, with a competitor. And uh, when you do something like this, when you solve a hard problem, it puts you in a really good spot. You know, you wake up in the morning and your competitor just posted a made top day. You don't even have to look at it. You know that they didn't solve this problem. Nate, it was it was a hard thing to do. There's no way they could do it. It's a good feeling to have. So my next topic: integrate. The easy one. You can just get really excited when you are integrate with apps they already have. Workflows they already use, like Dropbox. Woo! <laughs> Dropbox. It makes users feel more productive. They love feeling productive. All their apps are working together in a grand synergy. This doesn't necessarily have to be something complicated. Our Dropbox support is just when the PDF arrives on the Mac, instead of tossing it in the normal folder, we toss it in the Dropbox folder. But as far as people are concerned, this is the coolest thing in the world. We're just detecting the Dropbox is there, you know, creating a picture for you that goes to the Dropbox. And we do the same thing with Evernote. So, even if it's simple, what you're getting is, is um, name recognition. People will recognize Dropbox or Evernote and say, oh, I have that, maybe I need this. 
it'll make my workflow better. And um, the same thing with your website. You you know you're gonna have that when you up your website, creating that that familiarity. And um, the company that makes the app you're integrating with make it really exciting too. And think back to you. This happened at Amazon for us. They have a a cool database of apps that work with them. And we got we got it there and got it to Amazon. And you'll also probably hear from those apps competitors. Somebody wants to feel left out. So the biz dev guy from other Dropbox and that company start will start contacting you wanting to get on in on the action. So now I'm just some design tips. I'm not a designer, full disclosure. If you find you're not taking time educating the user, this is a red flag that we always look for. If, if, you, if you find yourself putting instructions on the screen that you're not intuitive and you're not going to make the user happy, this may seem obvious, but we see a lot of this. So, so I'll give you some extreme examples. Uh, so what happens when a user first installs OS X? Right? Now we'll this in your space. Now, you get this. So, so this I just think is, is, is terrible. Honestly, this could be someone's first impression of a map. Like a little demo video. And not only is there a tutorial, but there's actually like a little test you have to pass before you can proceed. Yeah, so this could be someone's first impression. So, um, are, are, the, are the hidden scroll bars, we can debate them all day, of course, but this should be the signal that they're not um, good intuitive design and that they're not going to make people happy. Um, we had a concrete example from our company. We had a customer asking um, how to find an app in the applications folder, and after some really confused back and forth, they planned emphatically that their application folder only went to G. And there was nothing after G. That was kind of awkward. We had to explain to them how to scroll. <laughs> Happy customers for that. And we gave an, an example of a just a crazy dialogue box. This is a totally extreme example, but a um, this is an instruction screen that a plugin puts up. Tell the user how to find the plugin later. Got to of this. That arrow is actually in the screenshot. Uh, we didn't have that. And um, so, if you ever find yourself doing anything remotely like this when you're designing an app, rethink it. Go back to the drawing board. You know, make it intuitive. And um, one more example of putting instructions on the screen is installing an you know, app. App is kind of fixed in the right? The app store. You don't nobody. No map geeks sit around anymore and debate and install it, right? But it's even more relevant now, I think. Because now that I was fixed installing, it, it should install it, it's easy to the standard for how easy it's really to be without the next step. And um, but what about some, what about a non-app store map? Like Dropbox. Again, just make sure you know your audience. Is, is Grandpa going to figure this out? Um, there is, again, instructions written on the screen that someone has to read. Now you may say, what's the problem? This is not very difficult. But the problem is, well, first of all, this is ridiculous. Because Dropbox doesn't even need to live in your application folder. It it's a, it integrates with the finder, right? I mean, why are you putting it in that to begin with? But secondly, you're teaching people new concepts. That may be new to computers. What's a disk image, Grandpa? What's an alias? What's what's dragon? Seriously, what's dragon? It, dragon can be something that's a shortcut. It should never be something that needs to happen. Not everyone knows how to drag, believe it or not, or they, they, at least they should. Okay, I dragged it. Why is it still there? Oh, because it copied. Yeah. Because it's a disk image of never mind, disk image. I'll explain to you later. And um, okay, is it open? No, still not open. Just go to applications, find it. It's good to know how to scroll applications. Um, okay, I've done with the counter example. But 
And the, 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 my point is, Dropbox could have just presented an installer, what standard we do, in, uh, install Drop, install Printopia. Uh, we, made, we went through a lot of work to make sure that this worked the way it should. Uh, you double click this, it does not even present you with any UI, it doesn't have to. It just does its stuff and fires up the app. And they don't, no one has to think about it. So people love this. Um, they absolutely love it and they rare about it. The fact that no configuration is needed. Your goal should be from the user to say, it just works. Printopia is a crack game, but it still ships with an installer. That's completely baseless. We do, we do housekeeping stuff, and we toss the crack game in place and we open it. But just the fact that they don't have to screw around with anything makes people really happy. They have to install it never open the app. I get that. Some people email us sometimes and say, you know, okay, what's next? What's, what are my next instructions? And if you really need to ask some questions of the user, first run to be the place to do that. The installer that app transitions can be seamless. Remember, this is probably someone's first impression. So it just works. One of the most popular ways about Printopia is it just works. And uh, people have a tweet about that. And a caveat before we move on. If your app, app actually is a bit complicated, you know, it's the user does need to learn about it. And um, Dropbox is another example of this. Um, so the first time you run Dropbox, you get a nice little tutorial that walks you through the app, shows you how it works. And there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure you're not explaining your way around something. Like you, you should be introducing people to the app, not explaining some weird thing. So, some ways to make your app just work make decisions for the user. Of course, um, this doesn't always apply. I mean, sometimes an app's going to make you need to sign up or log in. There's apps where, like, you open it and you just get a login screen. Because, you know, the app doesn't work without logging in. But maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you do want to let people into the app without logging in. Because then you have, then the app is running. You don't want that situation where someone tires up an app without logging on and then they cancel that quick. You may have been lost for five seconds with the, with that. Here's a pop up thingy from another competitor. Oh, uh, words, words and stuff. Okay. And that yellow arrow is actually part of the pop up. Um, so, this is just something to consider. If your app requires them to do some sort of potential setup that you can't automate, um, you may just want to forget about the app idea completely. You do want that to be all about that. If there's something like, oh, you have to go into this setting and check this thing, don't even bother with the app. You have to not look for it. The equivalent of that is don't, it may not be a good app idea. That app is just fair, it's just a fun one. A classic be like Apple, an example is FaceTime. I love this. They have like preferences, it's great out. It's like, yeah, not gonna see here for long. Anyone wanting to add a checkbox to the app has to make a case for it, but the app can't use without it. For example, iChats has a checkbox for using shapes instead of color the dots or color the lines or something like that. Um, it should be something where like you don't need it necessarily. Like in Printopia, we have advanced settings, but they're things that are not really needed by most people. Mostly people with write to support and you can send them in there and make some setting change for their gutter. But again know your audience DVI has like what a thousand settings. So that's the point of DVI. And finally Use very best. Our Printopia started out really simple. But it turned out to provide that magical experience. And that required a lot more than simple. Behind the scenes, the latest version has over 100 files, thousands and thousands of lines of code, all running behind the scenes, ensuring that you know, the correct thing happens when you hit print on all the various printers and, and, and setups. And 99% of that is completely invisible to the user because the end result is the user only sees symbols. And in other words, an app, a simple app is a simple code. The simpler and more magical 
and experience it. So the more code you probably need to make it work, to make it just work. And a final tip for you, I'm running really short here. Final tip before lunch is done. Don't wait until you're finished or even in beta to find out if people love your app. Instead of working in a vacuum like we kind of do sometimes, show people your app on a regular basis or at least once. The very quick version of Printopia was created in a month, but we still found this opportunity to show it to our local Coco Heads chapter in Boston. We just printed it our presentation and showed them the app. And uh, we got a lot of great feedback uh, on this. The input helped to shape the user interface. And one of the things that quickly becomes apparent when you demo on your app for the first time is the things people are suggesting are. Things you already know. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, that. But it'll be, it, it can be the, the impetus for actually taking action. You know? It wasn't just you thinking that. Uh, it's the kick in the pants you need to maybe change something big, or, or maybe even go back to the garage door or something. I remember a demo someone gave, like, so this kind of started with a series of people giving demo to your apps at Coco Head, and there was one where like, this guy was, had that on the screen, and he was just like, oh! Remember that? But anyway, yeah, so if you may need to reel that stuff, you know, I should really read the nice conclusions. And showing your app to your family doesn't count. <laughs> the earlier you can get your app in front of a, a large audience of, of, of critical people, the better. So to recap, spend time on the demo, have a demo, make sure it works, and it's a pleasant experience. Price to make users happy. I'm glad to hear we have someone else with $30 Mac apps. It works really well for us. Solve a critical problem. This has been essentially our business model from day one. And it's one that we're going to be sticking with until we are completely shut out by Apple. And uh, do hard stuff. Same deal. We're gonna that's work incredibly well for us. Um, Ken is usually getting in there doing some low level stuff that just makes that happen. Integrate with other apps, even if it's incredibly simple. Be sure not to educate the user. Think about about grandpa. And just work. Through really easy setup and installation and making most decisions for the user, like Apple does. High complexity to make it a magical experience people will tweet about. And finally, show up your app to more than your family. And that's the talk. Thank you so much. Hope you found it interesting. Um, yeah, we probably have time for one question, just one, and then the rest are um, because we're going to go to the line. Where? 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 Alright. But now I always get 